All right, chapter 10. So this chapter uh, introduces some new things while rehashing a bunch of old things. The, the chapter is on rotations, and so far we've really done basically things moving in a straight line. Um, we've done two-dimensional motion where objects will move in a straight line but in two dimensions, and then we break that up into components, uh, but we've never really done rotational motion. Um, projectile you can think of as a combination of two types of linear motion. So, and I guess you can with rotation as well, but uh, there's a big difference in how we treat rotational motion with then how we treat uh, projectile motion. So, uh, let me just briefly go through the main concepts before I go into each one in more detail. To start off with, rotational motion is related to linear motion and just like linear motion had displacement, velocity, and acceleration, so does rotational motion. Uh, displacement has the symbol theta, which uh, is kind of like an angle. It's angular or rotational displacement, meaning how far around a circular path angle-wise have you traveled. And to do that, we need radians. Now, your whole career so far in AP Physics has been changing your calculators to degree mode. Uh, this unit, uh, if you're using radians, then you want to keep your calculator in, in radian mode. So, And you'll often hear a revolution. A revolution is basically going around once. The Earth, for example, revolves around the Sun, has one revolution every 365 uh, plus a little bit days. But, as you've hopefully learned by now, in one circle there are two pi radians, so one revolution is equivalent to two pi radians. And so we'll need this because the unit for angular displacement or rotational displacement is radians. It's not meters or it's not revolutions. So we're going to have to convert quite a bit. Then uh, how quickly your rotational position is changing is known as rotational velocity and that has a unit radians per second. Just like, um, just like speed has units meters per second. And let me just quickly, so we got uh, the linear is meters and angular is radians. For velocity, uh, meters per second. And radians per second. And then how quickly your ang your angular velocity, or again, I'm going to use angular and rotational interchangeably, so you can see down here I use angular. Um, how quickly the angular or rotational velocity is changing is your rotational acceleration. And just like in linear motion, this is meters per second squared. This is radians per second squared. All right, so that's uh, main concept one. Now we take these, and just like in kinematics, we had some expressions. Uh, we just replace the r linear equivalent of these with these symbols. So we'll replace x with theta, v with omega, and a with alpha. So for example, average velocity is uh, delta x over delta t. Average angular velocity is delta theta over delta t. And if you want the instantaneous, you just take the derivative of that. And average acceleration is delta v over delta t. So average angular acceleration is delta omega over delta t. And if you want the instantaneous acceleration, you'll just take the derivative of your, velo your angular velocity function. And then we get our two primary kinematics equations. And we just replace the x with a theta, v with omega, v initial with omega initial, a with alpha, and same down here. And those are valid for any rotational motion. Basically, any expression that you use in linear uh, motion, you just replace the linear with the angular, and you'll, you know, it'll be correct. And then um, comparing linear versus rotational even more, we have this s is known as arc length. It's essentially, it can be a circumference if you go around in one revolution, but it's basically the distance you travel around a circular path. So there's a circular path. If you travel from here to here, 
you've traveled uh, half a circumference, 2 pi, r, uh, 2 pi r divided by 2, so pi r. And so that's the measure of s. That is your linear distance. You could actually take this curve and s flatten it out and get a line. So if you take this point and wrap it up here, you know, the length of this straight line, think of this as like string that you can wrap around here. So the lengths are equivalent. Anyway, the rate, the angular, let me do a smaller section now. So let's say s is from here to here. So, oh, that's gross. Yeah. <laughs> radius, radius. So theta would be the angle measure. And you can tell that radius plays a role because even with the same angle, well, I'm going to explain this more later, so yeah, anyway, I'll explain this in uh, the next slide. So let me just summarize this a little more. So um, essentially, the linear distance traveled around a circle is equal to the angular distance times the radius. And what that means is angular displacement is constant regardless of radial position. So what I was, that was what I was about to try, try to explain here, but I'll, again, I'll just briefly do it now. So if you're way out here, rate with a longer radius, you can see the angle between these two lines is still the same, but you'll, you'll travel a bigger s distance. Um, so anyway, same with velocity. Velocity equals omega r and linear velocity, linear acceleration equals angular acceleration r. And these rules apply for all of these for solid body. If, if you have things that are squishy and don't rotate uniformly, then this is not the case. And another couple terms, angular acceleration is your acceleration, sorry, um, tangential acceleration is your acceleration linearly around the circle. So if you're at this point and you're, you're speeding up along this path, um, then you'll have an angular, sorry, you have a tangential acceleration that way, tangent to the circle at that point. If you're slowing down, your acceleration would be opposite your direction of motion. Radial acceleration, which uh, we dealt with in uh, an earlier chapter, is center pointing points towards the center, and that is defined as centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, where v is your, this guy right here, linear velocity around the circle. All right, next page. Main concept four, i is rotational inertia or mass. So just like position, velocity, and acceleration have linear uh, rotational, sorry, rotational equivalents, so does a bunch of other, so do a bunch of other uh, physics concepts, including mass. So just like we have inertia or mass, m, and the more mass you have, the harder it is to accelerate and all that good stuff, you can have a rotational mass, so thing, things become harder to rotate based on how much mass they have and also how that mass is distributed from the rotational pivot point. Uh, for example, the rotational mass of a thin rod is one half ml squared. So the longer the rod is, uh, you can keep the mass the same, and but make the rod longer, and it will have a higher rotational inertia. It'll be harder to rotate. And uh, there's other formulas for different shaped objects on page 253. We'll go over that in more detail again later. The parallel axis theorem is used when you don't pivot an object, you don't rotate an object through its center of mass, and I'll talk about that more later. Just like you have a force, a linear force, if you have a rotational force, think opening a door. A door rotates around the hinges, right? So to do that, you need to apply a force a certain distance from the pivot point, and that is called a torque. It's a rotational force. A couple ways to express that. Torque is the radius times the force. It's actually cross. This is a cross product, and so um, the angle matters. The the more the angle is closer to 90, the stronger, the more torque you get. So uh, this implies, or this uh, expands to RF sine theta. Torque. This is Newton's second law. F equals m a. Torque is 
the rotational force, I is the rotational mass, and alpha is the rotational acceleration. So F equals MA, torque equals I alpha. This is literally substituting the letters, the rotational letters, in for the linear letters. And just like you can have net forces, you can have net torques. Rotational energy is just like linear energy. For example, kinetic energy rotational is one half I, um, uh, I omega squared, rotational mass, and rotational velocity. And you can use conservation of energy with rotations. You want to use the center of mass when considering uh, gravitational potential energy problems. And uh, energy, since energy isn't a vector, you can add linear and rotational energies together. So you can add a linear kinetic energy and a rotational kinetic energy. Whew. So I was having trouble there. I felt like I wanted to go into more detail on these. Um, so I really just wanted to introduce them and go into more detail later. Um, so I hope there w that wasn't a little too confusing. But I'll stop this video now instead of going on to the first concept in more detail. And we'll start that in the next video. Hopefully I can do three of these per video and do this in two more videos. Alright, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.